Next up, Patricia Church. And as I, I mentioned, this, this October 16th issue of New Science is extremely good. Pat has a piece in here as well, Roots of Right and Wrong. And as it says here, Patricia Churchland is a philosopher of neuroscience at the University of California and the Salk Institute, both in San Diego. Her book, Brain Trust, What Neuroscience Tells Us About Morality, will be published by Princeton University Press in March 2011. Pat. Great. Thanks very much. Thanks. It's a great pleasure in particular to speak after Sam Harris because uh, some of what I want to say really falls within the general structure um, that I think he has laid out. So the question that I'm interested in is where values come from. How is it that we have certain values that we live by, so that we cooperate with certain people, we help certain people, we share, we work together, we value certain things over certain other kinds of things. What I have found uh, useful to do in approaching this question is to look at the brain, the brain of humans, but also the brain of mammals in general, and to look at the brain within the context of the evolution of the brain. With a view to possibly understanding something about where values come from and how it is that we care about certain kinds of things. All animals, all vertebrates, insects, snakes, frogs, are organized to see to their own survival to see to their homeostasis, that is, to ensure that their body is the right temperature, that they have the appropriate levels of glucose, that they have water. And they're also organized to avoid certain kinds of threats and to approach things that they need. Priorities are set within the nervous system so that when there is a conflict between goals, the one with the greater priority takes precedence. This is taking care of one's own survival and one's own self-well-being. So the very interesting question for us as humans is where does caring for others come from? It's not magic. One of the things that we know is that in the evolution of the mammalian brain, many things changed. And in particular, because mammals had a different reproductive strategy than, say, fish. They gave birth to live young who were highly dependent on the mother and sometimes on both parents. In order to achieve this, there had to be a reorganization of the circuitry of the brain for caring. And basically what happened is that there was a, an extension of the, let's just call it, caring circuitry, so that the caring that I used to as a snake used to take care of myself, I now, as a rat or a vole, used to embrace others, in particular the dependent offspring. And so this very major step from self-caring to other caring was achieved early in mammalian evolution. As mammals evolved and other species came into being, their particular way of life and their particular social niche gave rise to certain other kinds of changes. And we can begin to document in the context of neurochemicals such as oxytocin and vasopressin and the supporting team of serotonin and dopamine and the endogenous opiates, how it is that these changes actually come about. Now, this does seem to me to be the fundamental source of human values. It comes out of the need to care for those who are our offsprings, our mates, kin, and in some cases, of course, it expands greatly to include friends in the group and those beyond the group. The particular form that values take may vary, of course, as a function of the ecological conditions and the history of a particular group, whether they were ruled by someone benevolent or someone nasty, 
Uh, it may vary as a function of many other kinds of things. And so we can see infanticide being quite common amongst the Inuit in the 18th century, but very uncommon in certain other groups who lived in much more prosperous and, uh, and easy kinds of conditions. So these seem to me to be the fundamental source of values. And in humans, because we are prodigious learners, and we begin learning social things right from the get-go, then our sociality becomes part of our intuitions about what is right and what is wrong and what is acceptable and what is not, when it's good to help and when it's not. Now, having said all this, um, because this was uh, advertised as a debate, I felt it incumbent upon myself um, to say at least some things of a kind of limiting sort. One of the things I should say, at least in part because of the law school's involvement in this project, is that despite advertisements to the contrary, neuroscience has not shown that no one is responsible for what they do or that no one ought to be held responsible for what they do. We're a long, long way from showing anything like that. So that's thing number one. Now, one of the things that I think Sam Harris asks us to believe or asks us to envisage as a consequence of the way he uh, sees things is that if you factor out false beliefs about the facts of the matter, then the evaluative facts about what is conducive to one's well-being or to the well-being of the group should be evident and we should get agreement. Now, of course, sometimes people are stubborn and there are temperamental differences, so we don't always get agreement. But even if we are temperamentally, as it were, on the same playing field, sometimes there are going to be differences. There are going to be differences, I suspect, in such issues as assisted suicide. And here's one that kind of troubles me. I think that there may be just fundamental differences in views about the value of shooting someone who is a non-combatant but who volunteers to be a human shield. Now, this is, has, of course, been a matter of considerable debate as a result of uh, the hostile interactions between Palestinians and, and Israelis. It's not clear to me that there are any additional facts of the matter that we could bring to bear uh, to solve that particular problem. I think there are going to continue to be really difficult issues about when a war is a just war, when it's acceptable to have a preemptive strike. From an entirely different direction, I think there are really difficult issues where it may be that we don't disagree about the facts, but we disagree about the values regarding such things as mainstreaming seriously handicapped children. Where I do, I think, agree with Sam is that there are cases at the nether ends of the spectrum, where it's very obvious that something really is not conducive to anyone's well-being, and on the other side, uh, things that are. Nurturing children is obviously on the good side, abusing children is not. Um, inventing braille so that the blind can read is obviously on the good side. But I want to suggest that there are a lot that are in the middle, and I don't really know the status of these. I don't know whether it's that we don't know enough factually so that we can predict what the consequences will be, or whether some of these things actually turn out to be fundamental disagreements about value. Um, so I have, I have some uh, here, such as feeding, uh, feeding the, the Biafrans. Now, as many of you will know, it turned out to be a rather disastrous intervention in the 1960s to simply send a lot of food aid to the starving Biafrans. Why? Because it prolonged the war. They had seceded from Nigeria, and once uh, things got bad enough, they capitulated, they were reabsorbed, there was no bloodbath, 
Um, but the, the starvation as a result of the blockade by the Nigerians persisted much longer than it would have if we had not intervened. So that's a sort of case where it seemed like a good thing at the time, feed the hungry. But it turns out that aid and just giving food to the hungry is not always uh, the best thing. But I think that's the sort of case that Sam can handle very well, because it's the sort of case where he can say, had we more facts, uh, we would have been able to do well. So, Roughly speaking, then, and this I sort of um, bring up in order to uh, play the devil's advocate, I think there are kind of three worries that I have about the idea that science is ultimately going to answer for us, or we can look to science to get the information on what we ought to do and what we ought to value. And one is that, unfortunately, and, and some of you will recognize this, uh, there can be arrogance and silliness on the part of academics. Um, there certainly are, I think, possibilities for academics to be very condescending, to say, look, I know what's best for you, sweetie. Uh, you should live your life in this fashion and not in that fashion. There is also a tendency amongst academics, partly because they live in a very sheltered, very privileged environment, to get silly. And by that, I mean that they can adopt hypotheses about what we ought to do, that really, when, if you're a person who lives in the real workaday world and you're up against it, uh, does not make very much sense. The second thing that I worry greatly about is ideological enthusiasm. And I mean enthusiasm in, in the good old 17th century sense, where that meant, you know, you sort of have great ideological fervor and go tromping off uh, at the behest of some demagogue or other. We saw this with terrible results, of course, uh, during the Cultural Revolution in China. And thirdly, there is, I think, a worry about do-goodery that takes on the form of intervening in the lives of others when you really should not. Um, there are, we all know, of course, and have, have encountered people who really wanted to change our lives for a way that they thought was better, or where they thought they had the normative high ground on some principle of rationality uh, or other. And the worry is that we must not take a bad problem and make it worse by sort of interventionist do-goodery when we really ought to be much more cautious. And so with that, uh, I think I've used up my 10 or 15 minutes, and I hope I've said at least something that uh, will be provocative for the others. Thanks. Thank you.